Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Digital Nomad World Weekly Series. I'm Becky, and I'll be your host. And today we're going to be talking about how to make friends on the road as a digital nomad with my guest, Yasi Fisher. Yasi, welcome to the show. Hey, how's it going, Becky? Thank you so very kindly for inviting me on today. I think it's going to be a fun time. Thank you so much for joining me, Yasi. As my background is going to attest, we met in Hoi An about a month ago. And I have to say, I was so impressed by how you made connections and how you brought people together. And so I thought this would be a perfect topic to cover with you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. But first, I'd love to hear how you got started with your digital nomad journey and how that has flowed along the way. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've gotten really good at, at, at taking the 20 years and breaking it down to a few minutes. But um, ultimately, um, I've been a nomad for the majority of my adult life. So I left Toronto, my hometown, in 2004, and I've been traveling ever since. So some places I do live for a few years at a time. Um, and over the last little while, it's been more like a few months at a time. Um, so I've lived, in, I've lived in 10 countries, uh, 12 cities. Um, and I've traveled the world. I've seen so many between client projects and just my own traveling around just to see the world. So um, that's kind of where it started. I, um, yeah, about in, in about 2014, I moved to Los Angeles for the first time. Um, my first time on my own, um, super intimidating, right? Like you go to a new country and I'm from Toronto and the, the state isn't so far away, but it was like, oh my God, like nobody knows me. And like, you get these ideas of being like, oh, well, like if no one knows me, then who am I? Like, who do I want to be? What do I want to do? Like, I can start exploring in a space where at first you feel vulnerable because you want to hold on to who you are. But then after a while, you're like, oh, wait, like, I can just try random things. And like, I can do open mics if I want. And for me, it was kind of in a vulnerable space that led into a more courageous kind of space in terms of learning who I was and experimenting and exploring, right? So I did that and uh, just kind of moved around. I went from uh, Los Angeles. I spent some time in Las Vegas. Um, which was awesome because when you go there and live there, um, you don't try to kill yourself in three days. You actually like enjoy the restaurants and the shows. And I met some amazing people there. And then throughout my life, I just kept on flowing. I lived in London for a while. I lived in Berlin for a while, Milan for a while, uh, Chisinau, Moldova for a while, um, Thailand for a while, Tel Aviv for a while. Um, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm here now in Vietnam where I started in Hanoi. Um, I dabbled a few different cities across the country and I settled into Hoi An and, and that's where we met. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been an adventurous journey. Um, a lot of emotional spaces in the mix, especially when you travel alone. Um, there were portions where I was with someone, but then there were other times where I was by myself. And there's a lot of dynamics there, but it, it's been wonderful. What a journey you've had. I mean, you've really covered the gamut of all these like big cities that you would expect people dream of living in. And it sounds like you did it not just for a day or two, but for, you know, some period of time. So I'd love to break down, like, what was the impetus? Like what first got you on the road? So I got out of high school at the age of 19 and started a clothing shop and I had it for four or five years and it was great. But the market was shifting and a few other reasons. It was just time to move on. But I was already traveling around to um, Las Vegas for trade shows. So I had a clothing boutique and I used to go to Magic and Project and Pool. Um, some people might be familiar with those um, with those conventions. And so I was already going back and forth a little bit. Like, obviously, I was then going to California and kind of started meeting a few people. And when I closed off my shop, I just kind of felt like I was already traveling a bunch and to stop like to not have my shop and then just kind of be in Toronto to figure things out. I was like, you know what? I think I just want to keep going and like really explore these cities as places to live as opposed to just like places to visit where up until that point in my life, every place that I went was just a visit. Um, and so that's kind of what it was. I was looking at my opportunities in the States based on um, the profession, like the career that I developed. And I was like, you know what? I'm like for fashion, better be in an international level than more local in Toronto. At the time, Toronto wasn't so big, it wasn't on the map. Um, I mean, it was doing its thing, but it was still very disconnected. And California, LA, you know, these are big places. And so I decided to take a deep breath and just go. That's incredible. And I guess you had always had, you know, an interest in fashion and, and all these clothes growing up because you, you would have had to have a lot of confidence, like at the age of 19 to have had a clothing shop. I know that's not every, you know, story you're hearing out there 
so young starting like that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know what? I mean, long story short there, um, I have always been in clothing. Uh, I've always had a fashion sense, but I was never really like a fashionista kid. I wasn't reading fashion magazines or anything. I just kind of had my way about me. Um, I was really rooted in different types of fashion cultures in the city, um, especially like the up and coming, uh, like urban stuff and streetwear stuff, skate stuff, hip hop stuff. And so through the culture, I actually navigated and opened up my first business because I found that there were so many of these stores downtown, but none of them were uptown. And so I found a little bit of a hole in the market, built up a, a boutique. And uh, yeah, listen, my parents have also been in the industry for a long time, um, more clothing than fashion, but nonetheless, like they were able to, you know, really teach me how to uh, negotiate, um, how to even open up a store, things like that. And then once we got everything structured, um, it was wonderful. They gave me the autonomy and, um, you know, really claimed that shop and, and did some really cool things with it. Um, and so, yeah, through that course of time, I opened up a lot of opportunities and a lot of conversations because I was traveling to the States a lot and I was bringing in brands. I started building more relationships outside of just my local space. And I think that that's what really inspired me to like keep going and to like really start opening myself up into international like realms. Yeah. And I can imagine like going to these trade conventions and the shows like you're and you're talking about your product like that's going to naturally push you into being as outgoing as you can be. And is that how you started feeling like the, making these first connections and friendships? Because I, I know you got on the road very early. How did you start making friendships? Yeah. So it's interesting to me because when I got out of high school, everybody was like forging friendships in like colleges and university and like, you know, things like that. And for me, I was 19. And so my industry, I was making friends. Like networking was a cool thing because I was excited and building up my business. But I was more and more <clears throat> outside of like the business meetings I needed for my shop. I wanted to make friends that were in the industry. Like I wanted to connect. And like for me, networking is relationship building. It's not, oh, well, I'm going to build out with you in case I need you. But it's like, oh, we have the same interests and we can talk about the same kind of things. And like you're traveling and I'm traveling. And you know, over the course of the years, you realize that, you know, people travel around so much, they move from different places, different careers, different, like, you know, home bases. And I learned that really quickly, like very early on and being like, oh, wow, like, I love that I can connect with people all over the world, because now I have friends like everywhere I go. Um, and a lot of these things, like I said, like, started off as like me, not just networking, but like, looking at it as forging friendships, I was so young, I had no idea where my life was going to take me. And I had all these opportunities to meet people. And so I didn't look at it as like using people. I looked at it as in like, I get to meet people from all over the world. I have no idea where my life's going to go right now. But it's awesome because I'm now building friendships in, you know, three different cultures and 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 like tapping into different countries. And yeah, I thought it was super exciting. And, and that's kind of how I started. I just, I was 19. I wasn't meeting people in universities and colleges and I wanted to make some friends. And so, you know, I'm, I'm lucky because in fashion, there's a lot of youthful people in that space. Um, and so I just navigated that because fashion connected with music and connected with so many different types of cultures. And it was just, you know, I mean, it was a pretty big party, um, but I was able to really connect and meet some people that really kind of like, you know, still to this day, like still, you know, really still like stay true to my heart. So. It's fantastic. And I know in 2004, you mentioned that's when you started traveling. To my knowledge, um, Facebook did not yet exist. Uh, all the social media and smartphones weren't out, weren't there yet either. It's a whole different world. So uh, I'm glad that you had this fashion industry and the and you were going to these trade shows because it had to be so much harder then. I think people have even forgotten what to do when they don't add people on a social media network. Yeah, it's interesting because actually way back when uh, there was MySpace. So, right. yeah, yes. so I was like pretty prevalent on MySpace. I had a little side job uh, designing MySpace profiles for people because you could like customize them. And MySpace was like the big first social app, like way before Facebook. Facebook came in a few years later and people were like, Facebook, it's, it looks so boring and bland. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it was one of those things where I really just tried to find every tool that I could, right? I mean, like through networking at shows and different things, I would meet people. Um, when I was in different cities, I would find out what was going on in them. And like, you know, I mean, there were still advertisements and billboards and things all over the place. And so I would really find things that I connected with. And like, you know, I didn't go and like make best friends everywhere I went. Sometimes it was just me hanging out. But over time, you kind of get this vibe and you start picking up, you know, like 
yeah, like just the places that you want to be. And, and, and like I said, experimenting and trying things I've never done before, because um, it was just, yeah, it was part of the excitement, you know, it was part of me understanding the world and, and getting to know myself. Fantastic. Can you give us some examples of when you were traveling, something you did that was like out of your comfort zone or a new thing you tried that led to a good connection? Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, let me try to think. There's so many things here. Um, led to a good connection. Um, well, I think that like over the course of the years since Facebook started coming out, I was paying very close attention to connecting to as many Facebook groups as I could within the space and the places that I were in. The same thing I did in, in Hoi An, um, the same things I did in Milan and different places. Like I would connect onto different like social groups and community groups and really get to like meet people and do that. So that was definitely a tool that I used to see also like what was going on in the city and like what people were doing. And a lot of the events on there are way more community building, like these big, huge, like ticketed events where it's just like a mass of people. Most people in those groups are building, um, experiences to connect with people. So that was a really, really nice big thing. Um, I have challenged myself in the past to go to open mics and just do something. You know, I think that when you're in spaces where people don't know you, it can be intimidating, but it can also be really liberating, right? So like, I remember um, I did my first open mic and I walked on and I shared something that I wrote that was really personal. And I kind of wanted to vocalize it even just for myself, like my own form of like therapy, like as I was traveling, I, you know, I wanted to really just express myself out loud um, and really just feel what that's like. Because social media has become this thing where we throw stuff into the abyss and we hope people connect with it. We don't know how many people get to see it. But these like human connections are super important and getting yourself out there is. And so I remember I gave, um, I went on and I just wrote something kind of like a spoken word type of thing. Um, and afterwards, people were just like, whoa, like, that was really cool. Like, that's, you know, a really interesting way to like look at those things and like, what's your name and like, where are you from? And like, how long are you here? And, you know, we start building up these conversations. And I know that a lot of people talk about small talk and they're like, oh, I hate small talk. And I kind of push back at that and I go, well, if you don't want to have small talk, then don't. Like if somebody asks you where you're from, then don't turn that into small talk, right? Like when people talk to me like, oh, where are you from? And I'm like, well, actually like, I was born in Toronto. I'm from many places. I'm currently from whatever city I'm in. And I start including my personality into it where like, then you engage with people that are not trying to have small talk. It's just, where do you start when you don't know somebody and you don't want to overstretch or like, you know, kind of like overstep your boundaries on questions. And so I think when people look at it like, oh, I don't want to go to these things and be around people for small talk, the small talk's up to you. Like if you, if someone engages with you back and like, in small talk or they don't like continue to engage well then you can walk away and like that's okay like not every conversation is going to be super profound and, and connective and fun but i think that if we take the ownership to be like yeah i'm gonna have the conversations i want to have and like i'm gonna connect with people the way that like i want to connect because if they connect with you back then you're interested about them and you're like oh that's super cool that like you're about this kind of stuff too and the conversations get more interesting so i think just keeping that in mind i think people use um small talk and um certain events is like a scapegoat. And I think that really it's on, it's on you when you travel, you really, especially if you travel alone, like, yeah, you have to do things that are a bit uncomfortable and you don't have to go through extremes, but I think it's important to take a deep breath and say, you know what, like, yeah, I want to connect and let me find the ways that I'm comfortable in doing that and then slowly build, you know? I think that's so important because like you said, it's so easy to just assume an event is going to be a certain way. Like when you said open mics, I, I, thought it must be about music, but wasn't even thinking, hey, you could just do spoken word and, and you can show your vulnerability up on stage in that way. And, you know, if you don't consider yourself a singer, now you can connect, you know, but maybe you would have avoided that kind of event if you just thought, oh, it's just people playing different instruments or, you know, I don't have, I can't sing, so I can't go. Yeah, exactly. It's an open mic. So once you get up there and you have the mic in your hand, you got three minutes and no one's really going to kick you off. So, I mean, you could, I've seen people do some very interesting things on an open mic. And uh, I mean, unless it's like specifically says like, you know, instruments, like open mic, like something like that. Um, but otherwise you can just get up. And like I said, like at the end of the day, like if you're in the city for just a short period of time or you're not sure, like whatever, like just go up and nobody knows you. Like you can't be embarrassed if you're not going to see these people ever again. It's just kind of fun and it's exciting. Like, I find that like, you know, when it comes to emotions, it's like the, the the feeling, the physical feeling that we get of excitement and nervousness 
is the exact same thing. It's the exact same feeling. If you feel nervous one day and you go, oh, maybe I'm just really excited about this. You go, okay, that's the same feeling and it, nothing's changed. And so when you can look at that and say, okay, maybe I'm nervous, but maybe I'm actually excited to like get out there. Maybe I'm excited to try something new. And like, maybe I'm like, pushing myself in a different way. And like, that's exciting for me. Um, because yeah, when you're a nomad uh, and you kind of commit to this kind of lifestyle, you really have to own the lifestyle. Like, you know, you don't have to be the most outgoing person. You don't have to go to every open mic and do these things. You can just go to the open mic. Yeah, exactly. And you never know what door is going to be opened. Yeah. Now I do, I do want to touch on something that really, I hadn't seen this to the level that you took it in Hoi An. Uh, so I had met you at the co-working space and also it was interesting. You told me that this co-working space hub Hoi An was the first co-working that you've ever really been going to. And after all this time you've been traveling and that surprised me, but then I'd also love for you to go into um, where you ended up staying in Hoi An and how you're using that space to connect with others. Yeah, totally. So interesting story about Hoi An. I, I was not expecting to come out here. I wasn't really sure. Um, like you, like I mentioned before, I've lived in a lot of really big cities over my life. And, um, I just moved to Hanoi and I thought I was going to be there for 12 months. And really quickly, I was like, you know what? Like, um, I wasn't really feeling big cities anymore. Big city mentalities. Like, I mean, Hanoi is kind of like a modern village as I like to describe it, but it still has like the progressive momentum of like a big city mindset. And so Next thing I know, I did some research and I was like, you know what, I'll go check out Hoi An. And when I when I started doing the research, um, the hub showed up. And it showed up not only as a co-working, but also like when I went to the website, it had a co-living. And I was like, you know what? That for me is enticing because I have been at a co-working before, just kind of briefly, like just to experience it. And it was just people coming, doing their work and leaving. And I'm like, I don't, I mean, I don't have an office to work from. Like, so like when I say I work from home, I actually enjoy going to coffee shops and like restaurants and different, like the beach sometimes and working from different places. Um, so I don't really need a co-working space, but what was cool was a co-living. Cause I'm like, okay. I'm like, I don't know anybody there, but if there's a kitchen, then chances are people are going to wake up in the morning and like make a coffee and like maybe make some breakfast and sit down at the table. And I was like, okay, this is kind of like a soft landing for me. Like I'm not going in completely blind in this particular environment, but I get to go and yeah, see who's playing cards at night and seeing who's like hanging out by the pool or seeing who's in the kitchen. And so the fact that it was attached to a co-working space was wonderful because I knew that there would be people there that I would connect with. People that aren't just like traveling, but people that are actually working and freelancers and entrepreneurs and, you know, all the, all, all, all the, all the like. And so that was kind of my big push because I was like, whoa, I'm like, I get to go and I already have an environment created for me to meet people. And there's people there that are probably going to want to be doing the same thing. That's why we, in essence, travel. And I think that the the special thing about um, the hub was that they had the co-living, which translated into the co-working where you'd see similar faces and then you'd see people at work. You know, it's not like you're going to work and you haven't met anybody. It's like you see people in the morning that you're like, oh, hey, like I'm catching you with the co-working. And then those people have already met other people. And then at the co-working, when you say hi to one person, there's somebody else. And it's this magical flow of things. And so, you know, I, I was very conscious of um, the process of kind of like how I'd get here and, and what I wanted. So I'm really grateful for the hub and it, it is, it's a special place and everyone's gonna find different dynamics and different co-workings and livings. Um, I just found this place and it really was, yeah, really, really wonderful. So did you live at the co-living when you first got there? Yeah, so I lived in the co-living for two weeks um, and they were like booked after that, which was interesting because I actually kind of, I'm happy that it happened that way because I'm staying here long-term. So at first I was going to like book it out and just kind of be there. And then I found out that they only had the two weeks, which just petered over New Year's, which was really cool. So I got here and I hit the ground running and just started looking for a place right away, found a place in a couple of days. Um, and then, yeah, I was like at the co-working and the co-living. It was a nice little flow. And then I was like, okay, I'm like, now it's time to really open up my life and really see more of the city, travel through it on my way to work, um, you know, kind of really get a feel for living here um, outside of a little co-working bubble. And so that's kind of where I started really, you know, going to 
yeah, just kind of experiencing the city and being like, oh, wow, like there's so many more people that aren't part of this little bubble. Um, you know, there's so many uh, wellness centers and there's so many cool restaurants. And I bought myself a bike, like a like a bicycle. Um, and I just cruise around and like, you know, like I don't meet people when I'm cruising my bike around, but I get to enjoy the the environment. I get to see who's around. I get to catch a vibe for the city because it provides a lot of conversation places. And um, yeah, it's, it's important to integrate as much as you can, I think. Definitely. But for me, the game changer where you took it to this next level was when you rented a house in Hoi An. And I'd love for you to share how you found this house, how long you're planning to stay there, and then what you started doing with people from the hub in connection with your house. Yeah, totally. So I'm a big fan of community and connection. That's really, really important for me. It's something that is unfortunately not the most prevalent in big cities. Um, I mean, you can find your communities, but it's really difficult to like really build a community. There's, I kind of say this all the time, like there's a difference between uh, having a community and having a network. And like the best way for me to describe this is like, if you're sitting on the side of the street at a coffee shop, a network like drives by and like waves and says what's up and keeps going. A community sees you and goes, oh, wait, one second. And they put their bike aside and they sit down like, how you doing? What's going on? Like, or they, they kind of just pull up and they stop for a minute and they like really engage. Um, and that's kind of the difference I think. And they're both valid. I love my network of people because not everyone has to be my best friend and part of my network, but I need, I really enjoy the community and really like integrating and getting close to people. So what ended up happening was I went onto the Facebook groups again and I joined all the Hoi An uh, Facebook groups that were possible. And then I just posted and I was like, I mean, I looked at, I looked at, um, at, uh, um, at, uh, Airbnb and I looked at a go I looked at booking like I covered all my bases to see what the range on that side of things was and then I went on these groups and I saw a lot of people like posting for places so I just made a post and I was like looking for this looking for this looking for this looking for this really specific I got a bunch of places sent um I did the I did the post a few days before I got here because places go so fast it was pointless to like be looking at places a week or two before and then getting here and nothing being here so I was like whatever's posted um whatever's being like um uh, whatever's available within a few days of me arriving, that means that I can see them, I can book a viewing, and my chances are really high and not being so disappointed. And that's what I did. Like the first two days, um, I saw like nine or 10 places the first day. Um, the place that I'm in right now was the second place that I saw. And I was like, yeah, but it's the second place that I saw. Like, I don't know what's out here, but I wanted to make sure I saw as many places as soon as possible. So I didn't like take me a couple, like take me a week or so and then wanting that other place, but people sometimes just snatch, right? So strategically, I kind of found this place and a reason why I got myself a home, you know, a lot of people ask me why I got a home instead of staying at a homestay or kind of like an apartment. And it's because I really wanted a, a place for a few reasons. I wanted a place that I could bring people together. Um, and that kind of goes into what you're asking me. So creating events and creating spaces that bring people together, whether it's house parties, um, which I had over, over Lunar New Year, which is amazing. I had like 40, 50 people here that I've connected with since I've been here, which was amazing. Um, everyone just sharing their energy and you were here as well. And it was just like a lovely, a lovely time. Um, but it was a way to like have get togethers, to have a kitchen, maybe for some dinners. Um, and also I do like meditation flows. I do guided visualization workshops and things like that. So it's a very safe space that's also quiet that can facilitate a lot of people. I have a rooftop terrace, which was one of the things I really wanted. And so everyone can just come in and connect. And so I also wanted a place where people could visit. You know, the the rent is 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 really reasonable out here. Uh, you'll find a range, but ultimately I found one that worked for me. And a big reason why I wanted that was because I wanted to be able to have a space and a couple of extra bedrooms for friends. Because when people travel, the accommodation is usually the most annoying and the most expensive part, especially when you're traveling throughout Southeast Asia. And I was like, you know what, if I can just like talk to a friend and be like, yo, like all you have to do is buy a ticket and land and everything else is taken care of, but you got a space, you can leave your stuff, it's private, like you have your own. I, for me, that was amazing. So that was a big reason. It was to be able to invite friends. It was a way to also um, bring community together and also share my gifts in a space that, you know, I get to curate, you know what I mean? Like I am really, really happy the way that all worked out and um, and yeah, like, you know, I'm grateful that I can bring people together and, um, you know, the, the, the co-working groups are awesome. I did some posts on, on some of these groups. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just a way to figure things out and, and to bring community together, like not just for me, but also for other people that are traveling and like, don't always want to go to a bar or a restaurant every time they get together with someone. 
It's like, no, it's come out here. Like, I think over, I think next week, um, I'm going to introduce uh, movie night here. I've got a big living room and like, I got a cool couch and a bunch of seats and a bunch of cushions. And it's like, let's just have a movie night and like, just feel like, just kind of feel like we're a home outside of home. I think that's really important. You know what I mean? Cause otherwise you're either like in your room with like a bed and a desk or you're going to bars or you're going to restaurants and yeah, you, you can go to the beaches and, and explore the city, but we very often have moments where we feel like we're home. And like, I, I like that I can create an atmosphere here that really just feels like home for people because it's important. And it's important for me too, too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that like when I visited your home for your house party and also for one of the meditation flows, it, it made me realize what is, I think, so often missing when you're a nomad and you're traveling. And that is, you may have a wonderful co-working space and they may have a co-living, but still it doesn't have the feeling of home like it does when there's one person inviting everybody in, park in my front yard, like come in, here's the kitchen, here's the snacks. Like everybody was so connected at that event and it's hard to, it would be hard to manage for like a co-working space to do this themselves, but to have that, like even a fourth space, we can call it besides your home, besides your work or whatever, a third space, you, you to go somewhere where you, like you said, you feel like home, but you feel there's space. You feel there's, you know, it's not just a room and a desk. It's like, that's what I think really can help like turbocharge our connections as we're like being nomads around and and i really felt like you were the catalyst at least in hoi an for that and i'm sure like if, if you were starting to look hard enough you'd find maybe another person in hoi an that had rented out a house but like maybe like i don't know house party dot world or something like people you know <laughs> more more people that are doing this that that really forge these connections but you were so approachable as well i think it's like making that effort to like get the house but think about yeah what it could what it could be used for and how it, it really can connect people. And if we feel comfortable with you, we're going to come again and again to these events, you know? Yeah. And likewise, like I met a bunch of really awesome people and everyone's got a great vibe and like, yeah. And like outside of like, just like the, the concept of a home, like it's a home. Like I have floors and bedrooms and a kitchen and like a living room. And like just that feeling itself, just walking into a home makes you feel also that like your friend is inviting you over. Like, you know, out here, people aren't inviting each other to like their, their rooms, like in terms of just hanging out, people are hanging out in the lobbies or hanging out out of out of the space because it's not comfortable. It's like a bed or a bed in like a and 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 like it's it's great. You can find places for yourself, but it's a little bit different. And so just the feeling of like walking into a home. I think was really important, especially nomads. Like, you know, for most nomads, if you really think about it, like how often you get invited into a home, like let alone like a house party filled with friends. Like it's such like a, a nostalgic thing. And I think right away, it's like, everyone's just happy to be at a house party with like good energy and good vibes. It just brings us back to those days of just connecting like in our hometowns with like, just pe it just makes you feel comfortable. It's like, I don't know. It's like this nostalgic kick, this nostalgic kick that just kind of like, yeah, it just kind of allows the 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 experience to just flow really naturally and comfortably. Yeah, and it doesn't feel like a company, oh, did you like, are you registered on Yossi's home website? Are you, you know, having to check all the boxes? You can just come in and start connecting with people, start connecting with you. And I really hope that, you know, people who watch this or are listening, like, this generosity of spirit. Like if we can all start being more generous and and maybe even seek places and think about trying to replicate this in other parts of the world, it might be more expensive if you, if you rent a place like this, but you've got a longer lease. So I know you're paying less per month than you would have if you'd done like a month or two. Not all visa programs allow you to stay long-term either. I know for you, you're actually going to do some visa runs, but it's, there's not a barrier to you getting this rental, which I think maybe people also don't think about renting a place longer and just coming in and out, you know? Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, like, so the way that I worked it out is like, I have, um, I'm doing six months at a time, um, but I have a 30 day clause where I can give them 30 days notice. And so I think that it's really important as a digital nomad, as you're traveling around to really just be aware of the countries and the limitations and like what kind of life you can really have, like based on your financial, uh, your financial scale. Um, and also based on your, like, you know, your, your, your ability to stay for X amount of time. And so I think that like as a digital nomad, it is really important to like kind of map yourself around. Maybe you want to get to a part of the world where, you know, like, you know, here in Southeast Asia, it's really cheap to travel around and different, um, like different countries have different requirements. 
But I do check all those things, you know, like, and I think it's important to be very responsible. So for me, during my entire life, borders have been sacred. I don't do anything that's going to close off any border for me because the way that the world's going, the way opportunities work, the way that like our lives and the people that we meet flow, I never want to have anything to be a barrier of an experience in my life or a growth space or an opportunity in my life. And so I think it's really important to just be very aware of you know, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, because you don't want to overstay and then have issues and problems. Um, one quick little tip, which I always highly recommend is, oh, like if you're going to book, like if you're leaving a country because you have to leave for a visa or just because you're leaving anyways, I recommend leaving like a three or four day buffer between like the time that you actually have to leave. Because in a lot of countries like this, like you get delays and your planes get delayed. And you don't want to be like, oh, well, my visa expires on the 18th. I'll book something on the 17th. Because if for some reason that flight gets delayed by one or two days, well, now you've overstayed. And like you you might be able to take a bus to another country, but then you're spending more and it becomes more awkward because then you it becomes this like show. So I think it's really important to just, yeah, just to be mindful and, and conscious of like where you're going. Um, you don't need a, like a dead set plan, but just understand the dynamics of the areas that you're going to. And like you just said, I mean, a big reason why I'm here in Vietnam is like earlier on last year, they gave one month single entry and that was challenging. So I didn't really stay here because it was too many visa runs and I had to leave and come back and it was costing me a little bit of extra money because flights back and forth, hotels in different places. Um, but what ended up happening was they opened up the visa here and they now it's three months multiple entry. And then you can also renew it back to back to back to back as long as you're following the rules and you're not overextending and you're leaving when you need to and you're you know kind of playing by the rules out here. Um, and to me, that was a winner because some places in Europe, like you can go for three months, but then you have to leave for three months. Like you can only be in a country for 90 days with 180 days. So whether it's one month at a time or three months at once. And so, you know, it's important to navigate and kind of see what makes the most sense and your time zones and things like that when you're working. But, you know, it, it's pretty straightforward if you just kind of like look at it at a very clean, basic level and just say, okay, how can I simplify this so I don't have issues? Um, you know, one other thing I really highly recommend, this just came to mind, is that when you're looking for visas online for your country, also look for permits for that country. I got hit when I was on my way to Korea, and uh, I was only it was only a stopover, which was even more intense because I ended up missing my flight. And if I didn't get on a flight soon enough, I would have missed my um, um, my my connecting flight out of the country. Um, but ultimately what ended up happening was I got to the, I got to the airport. So silly. I got to the airport and I get to the front and they go, um, they go, uh, do you have your paperwork? And I go, well, I'm Canadian. I don't, I don't need paperwork. I looked online. I don't need a visa. And they go, no, you don't need a visa. You need a permit. And so I'm looking for like V like, you know, uh, visas for Canadians in Korea and everything's like, you don't need a visa. You don't need a visa. And then, but then it turns out you need a permit. So um, just look at the entry uh, regulations and, and cover your bases. Um, that's one lesson that I've learned and we'll never make that mistake again. Um, yeah, but, like was that, did you have to pay for the permit? Was it kind of like a visa yeah, I mean, under a different online. name? Yeah, I just didn't get it okay. in time before my flight left, but then, you know, the flight cost me extra and like whatever it is. Um, but also at the same time, I think it's important to just be aware of like, that's part of the adventure when you're a nomad. It's, it's, there's like, I'm laughing about that now. I was in the airport being like, if I'm, you know, like my brain, I'm like, if I miss my flight and then I don't get a flight, and like, you know, but looking back at it, it wasn't gonna be that severe. And like, it's part of the story is like, no, nomading is just really about the stories and, you know, be safe and don't over trust people but also be open enough to like trust yourself enough to navigate through the places that you're going. You know what I mean? Like a lot of places are really, really nice because it drops your guard. Um, it doesn't have to be like blatantly not safe. Um, and I say it all the time. It's like, I trust everybody, but that doesn't mean I'm going to walk around with my, uh, my, with my wallet hanging outside of my pocket. Like I'm not going to entice anybody to like do me wrong. I'm going to be very mindful and aware. Um, and then I'm just going to navigate. Like, you know, sometimes you might get into a, uh, um, uh, a scooter accident. Um, you know, you might go to a market and find out that you've been overcharged for a long time. You might end up missing a flight or not getting visas you need. Like, make a little bit of room in your in 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 your budget for 
discrepancies like that, like little things that you don't expect, just so you have it aside. Like if you could put $500 aside, $1,000 aside, um, at least you know that like when things are happening, you're like, all right, like fine. Like I put a bit of a, I put a bit aside anyways for this and then just enjoy it. Like, I mean, feel your experiences. I don't think you need to be smiling um, all the time. I think that it's important, especially when you're feeling, I don't know, a lot of things like sometimes as a nomad, you feel really lonely. Like, you know, you want connections and people come and go so quickly. And, you know, one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of people put up, put up a guard and they're like meeting people, but not opening up themselves enough. And I guess for me, the reason why I've been able to do what I do and create what you saw, kind of like what I've been doing out here is that like, I, I identify that that's the situation. And I'm all in with everybody. doesn't mean that everyone's going to be my best friend. I'm not trying to make best friends, but I'm like, you know what? Like I'm going to be here and I'm going to put myself into every interaction that I have. And if I have a great connection and we become best friends, amazing. If the best friendship is only for two weeks, well, we had some great times and awesome conversations and I wish you the best. And then sometimes you connect and like, I met friends that, that like through my travels that I'm still really close with. And, and that's the thing. I think that when you get into this mentality, you realize that like, People travel a lot. You travel a lot. You never know who's going to be where, when, and you just kind of build this stuff up. You know what I mean? And so even relationships, like, you know, dating and stuff like that, like I'm the kind of person where I'm like, you know what? I understand that people want to move around and travel, but also people want to connect. And I'm actually okay with like having like really beautiful relationships for like two weeks, a month, like without holding back and feeling weird and then like already missing the person and feeling alone before they even leave. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go all in here and like also like protect myself knowing that this will end, but have fun. Like, wouldn't you rather make mo the most incredible memories with people and have like wonderful moments with friends as opposed to being reserved and just being like, well, it's going to end soon. In my opinion, it, 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 it's an emotional space you need to be aware of. And I'm not saying that everyone, like I said, needs to put themselves out and try to make best friends, but what I've noticed for me that really works is just being like, yo, I'm me. I love connecting with people. I want to connect with people. I'm not going to hold myself back because I I don't want to play in the middle of like connecting, but not connecting. I want to connect with as many people as I can for as long as that is. And like, just, I don't know, like appreciate it. Like the only, the only thing we have at the end of the day is, is our stories. It really, really is like after you've after you, you stop working and, you know, like you're retiring or like, you know, you're late into your 80s, 90s or 100s, you just look back and you go, man, like what a life I live. Like all these experiences, like all these stories, like the most random stuff. And like, oh, man, remember when that happened? Like, what was I thinking? Like, but it's so it, it becomes entertainment. It becomes this beautiful gift of experience. And I think that, like, if you're going to go in, then just go in, like go all in. Don't travel around the world, but then like stay, you know, in your own little bubble and eat only the foods that you know, and only connect with people that like, um, that are like, you know, within your vicinity and like really put yourself out there, like get yourself going. You know, I think it's, it's the most magical thing that we can be nomads or expats and travel around the world. It's, it's wonderful. And I think that, you know, we do it for the experience. And I think that it's important to not hold yourself back. That is so beautifully said, Yasi. And thank you for taking us through this like thought process and how you operate as a nomad and how you go all in. I think that's a really powerful thing to kind of leave everybody with is like, have you been going in enough when you've been traveling? Maybe it's been something that's been keeping you from deeper connections. It's funny because we talked about small talk and people may avoid even talking because they're like, I don't want to do that. But, you know, you start small and then you you can, it leads to simply going all in. So Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your story with us today. And I hope that somebody listening or, or watching this got some, got an idea. Maybe they're now going to look more for houses in their next place that they want to stay longer. And maybe it's going to lead to more connection. You never know. But really, thank you for sharing all this with us today, Yasi. Is there anything else that you'd like to add before we go? You know what? I really appreciate the conversation and being invited on here because this is a journey that I've been on for like, almost 18 years now, um, way before this was even a thing. And so seeing more people out there doing more things, I think it's wonderful. Um, and I think the only last thing I would say is like, there's no right or wrong way to travel. There's no right or wrong way to be a nomad. A lot of people get into traveling and they're like, oh, like, well, I should see all the temples and I should do this. And like, oh, well, what if I tell people that I just hung out in my hotel room all day? And they're like, really? 
like your traveling is about you. And even though I'm talking about being, you know, like more extroverted and putting in the effort, if that's not your flow, like it's not your flow. I just don't want people to hold back and feel like they're not getting the full experience that they want. If you want to nomad around the world and just like be solo and hit the beaches and just sit and just love yourself and your life and, 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 and make the space, like do that. You know what I mean? Like if you want to just rent like a small little room that just makes sense because that's all you need and like, then go do that. Like, I think it's really important. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my truth. I'm sharing my story here. This isn't the way that everyone should do it. I'm just giving um, some, some perspective and some things to think about and to consider when, when other people are traveling. I found what works for me. It's no matter what going to be an emotional space. It's going to be a journey. I just know that my journey is authentic to me. And it doesn't matter to me if I decide to rent a space in Thailand and all I want to do is look at the view and not go out. Or if I'm in Hoi An and I decide to invite people in and get a home and like really engage, you know, you can have any kind of experience you want. They don't all have to be the same, um, but travel for you, travel for yourself, travel for the, the experience that you want, not for what's expected or what you think you have to do. Just do you. And I think other than that, just enjoy the magic. It's, it's pretty brilliant. Enjoy the magic. Love it. Yasi, if people want to follow you, where can they go? So you can follow me on Instagram at Yossi underscore Fisher. Um, that's probably the best way to find me. Um, I think my 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 website's on here. So you can always like go check that out. And then all my socials are listed there. Um, I'm on all socials. Yossi Fisher is pretty much, I'm pretty much the only one that shows up for the most part. Um, but you'll notice me, uh, you know, you catch the vibe here and, and it'll show up. But um, yeah, if anybody wants, if anybody has any questions, I'm so open to sharing um, any kind of feedback or insight. If you have any questions, even if you're going through something as a nomad and you just want to like chop it up and just talk and just be like, yo, listen, like it sounds like you kind of get this or have you ever experienced this? Like I'm all about sharing and opening up spaces for, you know, healthy conversation and, and safe spaces. So I'm around like I I, I really enjoy and uh, and anybody who would like to um, is more than happy to reach out wherever you find me. I'm there. Thank you so much, Yasi. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your time in Hoi An and thank you for connecting with us. Becky, thank you so kind for having me today.